Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many of you here. Thank you for tuning in to the second panel of the three-part speaker series, Resilience, Recovery, Repair, hosted by May We Gather in collaboration with Tricycle and funded by the Asian Pacific American Religions Research Initiative, APARI. My name is Chenzing Han. I'm one of the organizers of May We Gather, and I'll be moderating today's panel. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. And thank you also to Aaron Straley and Johnny Randawa for helping with technology behind the scenes. Today's session will be 90 minutes, which will give us time for two presentations as well as Q&A with our distinguished speakers. So you can ask a question at any point during our session by typing it into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we have the chat open right now for about five minutes. So please feel free to, like last time, type in where you're calling from and what brought you today to today's panel. Also, like the other two events in our series, today's panel will be recorded. So we will be sharing all three videos with registrants at the very end of our series. So you can keep an eye out in your inbox for that message. And we'll also be posting the recordings to May We Gather's YouTube page. For those of you who don't know, May We Gather is a collaborative project of commemoration and healing by and for Asian American Buddhists and their spiritual friends. In 2021, we organized the National Buddhist Memorial Ceremony on the 49th day after the Atlanta spa shootings. This year, to mark the three-year anniversary of the shootings, we're organizing a National Buddhist Ceremony and Pilgrimage in Antioch, California on Saturday, March 16th, 2024, which is just over a month away. You can learn more about the pilgrimage and register for in-person attendance on our website, www.maywegather.org, and the event will also be live streamed for those who wish to attend virtually. Building on discussions generated from the 2021 memorial around racial and religious erasure and recovery as they relate to Buddhism, this speaker series offers insight into the historical as well as the contemporary contexts that shape the upcoming May We Gather pilgrimage. And our series brings together community elders and leaders, historians, um, and archaeologists, educators, spiritual teachers in conversation to reflect on gender and immigrant experiences, folk religion and spiritual life, and contemporary projects of restoration and repair in California and beyond. So for those of you who tuned in, you'll know that in the first event of our series, which was titled Resilience, a story of 19th century Chinese immigrants in Antioch and beyond, we were able to have Lucy Meinhardt and Jean Falzer in a conversation moderated by Duncan Williams, and we had a chance to learn more about how the historical dynamics of anti-Chinese violence were intertwined with broader systems of racial violence against Native Americans, against African Americans, and we also saw how racial violence is entangled with gender and religious discrimination. So, for example, in instances where 19th century Chinese immigrant women were scapegoated as prostitutes in campaigns to pai hua or drive them out, and also an in inflammatory rhetoric by white Christians who scorned the, quote, heathen chinny. Jean and Lucy also shared powerful stories and images about both past and present day acts of resistance, resilience, and restitution in the face of ongoing harm in places like Antioch and other parts of California and beyond. So today's panel, Recovery, the History of America's Early Buddha Taoist Temples, will also continue to draw these connections between the past and the present. And this time we'll focus on Chinese temples and shrines that really thrived during the 19th century and early 20th century here in America. And we'll learn more about the roles of these temples, the reasons so few of them survive today, and also how the process of cultural and religious recovery through architectural and archival research can offer insight for our contemporary times. So we're so delighted to have three excellent speakers with us today, Drs. Che Mei Ho, Bennett Bronson, and Jonathan H.X. Lee. Their decades of research have really been a huge inspiration to all of us at the May We Gather Collective, and we're just really deeply honored to host them today and to share their work with all of you. So I'll introduce each of our speakers before they give their presentations, and then we'll have time for Q&A towards the end of our 90-minute session. And again, you're welcome to submit your questions in the Q&A box at any point. So by way of introducing Tremay and Ben, I thought I would actually share a few slides of my own, like Duncan did. 
um, a couple of weeks ago. So last spring, several of us in the May We Gather collective team were fortunate to join a group of scholars and students on a trip to visit a number of 19th century Chinese temples in Northern California. And I know that Jonathan will be speaking to some of these places. Uh, so the trip was organized by Professor Robert Ashmore, as well as doctoral candidate Hannibal Taubes from UC Berkeley. And this photo is from the Chico History Museum, which includes a display of this beautiful elaborate altar from a 19th century temple in Chico that operated, as you can see, from 1884 to 1939. And Chico is about three hours north of San Francisco. And at the museum, you can see beautiful images like this one um, of a procession. And though we're separated by several generations from the procession that's pictured here, and the understandings of Taoism and Buddhism and folk religion have certainly shifted greatly over the past century, our upcoming March 16th pilgrimage is nonetheless very much inspired by images such as these ones, by these kinds of communal, cultural, and religious gatherings. And as part of this Northern California temples trip, we were able to spend several hours at this extraordinary place, the Weaverville Joss House in Weaverville, California, which is about four and a half hours north of San Francisco. And it's part of the California State Park System, and it's also the oldest continually, continuously used Chinese temple in California. So I'll just show a few images to kind of give you a sense of the worlds we're entering into for today's panel. As you can see, the interior is extraordinarily well preserved. Here are some images of the altar. <clears throat> And also very well preserved are the living quarters for the temple attendant. And among the many striking things about the temple here are the donor names that are calligraphed uh, along the wooden walls, as you can see. And if you kind of zoom in, we were really struck in particular that there, the donor names included the names of, you know, to use the phrasing of that day, Chinese prostitutes of the time who are also donating to keep their spiritual, these spiritual and cultural refuges alive. And then, you know, outside is something, a more recent installation of a statue of Guan Ying, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, who will be our central icon of the May We Gather pilgrimage on March 16th. So I show you these slides in part because one of the organizers of this trip, Hannibal, very kindly introduced me to Chui Mei Den, whom I had the great pleasure of meeting in person on a trip up to Seattle. And Dr. Ho and Dr. Bronson are the authors most recently of the book Chinese Traditional Religion and Temples in North America, 1849 to 1920, California, which, as Hannibal notes in his review of the book, should be on the shelf of everyone interested in Chinese art and religion, Asian American studies, immigrant visual cultures in the Americas, and California generally. So I'm going to stop my share for a moment just so I can now introduce Dr. Ho and um, Dr. Benson more formally. And we'll kind of invite them here as well. Hello. Dr. Chimei Ho, hello. <laughs> Great to hello. see you. <laughs> Dr. Cheme Ho has done much of her research on ceramic archaeology in East and Southeast Asia and on Chinese American history. She received her BA from the University of Hong Kong in 1977 and her PhD in art history and archaeology from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London in 1984. She was a research fellow at Oxford University from 1984 to 87, and between 1980 and 1997, she did archaeological work in China, Thailand, and Indonesia, and worked at several museums in England and the United States. From 1987 to 2007, she was adjunct curator of Asian anthropology at the Field Museum, and in 2002, she was the founder of the Chinese American Museum of Chicago. In 2008, she co-founded with Bennett Bronson, the Chinese in North America Research Committee in Seattle, and we'll post a link to that in the chat. She has published extensively on her research projects, including being an editor for quarterly newsletter of Asian Ceramics Research Organization. And Dr. Bennett Bronson specializes in Chinese American history and in the development of human cultures in East and Southeast Asia. He was involved for many years in archeological and ethnographic work in Asia. Since 2000, he has focused on the history of Chinese in the Midwest and in the Pacific Northwest between 1850 and 1950. 
Working with Dr. Choi Mei Ho, he has visited, studied, and photographed the Chinese American collections of the majority of relevant museums and sites in the Western United States and Canada. Ben graduated from Harvard University in 1960 and received a PhD in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania in 1976. And from 1971 to 2008, he was curator of Asian anthropology at Chicago's Field Museum. And from 1988 to 2007, he served as adjunct professor of anthropology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Ben has published a number of articles and four books on China-related topics, the latter co-authored with, with Dr. Chime Ho and has co-edited two Chinese-American history websites, ccamuseum.org and synarch.org. So I'd love to turn the floor over to both of you, Chime and Ben. Thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you very much. So now I should um, share the screen of my PowerPoint. And, uh, goodness, I can't tell which one. <laughs> I mean, this one. Eh? Uh, no. Here we go. Okay, so Ben, why don't you start? Okay, well, I'll begin then. Um, we are going to be talking a little bit about um, temples and about the peculiar situation where um, you would think an alien religion, alien to most Americans, um, involving things which were not too familiar to them, although indeed one or two early commentators remarked that the interior of Chinese temples reminded them of the interior of Catholic churches, lots of decoration. But on the whole, um, Americans um, did not were not convinced by what they saw, but on the other hand, they were surprisingly, as we'll see, not as hostile as you might think to the alien religion. Um, there was a lot of violence in against Chinese, a lot of excluding, a lot of drivings out, and quite a lot of actual deadly violence, especially in the Pacific Northwest, more so than in California. But you would think that because of the general hatred and bad publicity that Chinese were getting all over the Western United States, not so much the East, in fact, you would think that Chinese temples were um, largely destroyed by, um, by anti-Chinese elements. But as it happened, that was not actually true. Temples were destroyed when Chinatowns were burned, as in San Jose in 1887, um, also, also as in Antioch. There was a lot of destruction of Chinese uh, Chinatowns, but the temples often survived one way or another. But I want to also point out that this particular photograph is uh, exceptional in, in my in my opinion because of the structure. You know, not only that it has the kind of uh, a courtyard structure, but close in the middle, as you can see the tower-like thing in the middle in the profile, which actually is very comparable to the one in uh, Weaver Wheel that uh, Jen Sang just showed us in one um, in the Weaver Wheel Temple. But we don't have such a beautiful profile as this one. It's too bad that it was burned. Next one. Yeah, I'll keep on going. So the problem, the interesting fact is that for reasons that might be constitutional, that might be due to American custom, Americans rarely attacked temples, white Americans. They attacked just about everything else connected with Chinese. But as this, um, as this, um, quotation from a very knowledgeable editor of the San Francisco Chronicle said, he doesn't know, you know, of very many attempts to actually attack Chinese in their religious houses. And that's in spite of the fact that the religious houses, which they often called joss houses, were regarded as centers of vice and centers of drug, the drug trade and so forth. But basically, the rioters and the destroyers stayed away from the temples, and we do not know exactly what was going on in their minds. Um, the temples were often um, were often uh, uh, rebuilt. There are a few that survive in their original form or original outside shape. One of the best ones is the one in Marysville, the Bokai Temple. The temple in Weaverville, as we've heard, is um, in, it's not terribly traditional Chinese because it's built entirely out of wood, but otherwise the shape is quite Chinese. The interior of that temple is the only well-preserved interior of any temple in North America. 
the only one we're certain it was pretty much the way it was in the 19th century. Now, the reasons why temples, um, temples disappeared. There were more than 200 in California back in 19, back in the 19th century. By now, there are very, very few left. What happened to them? Um, some of them were fires when the whole, entire, whole Chinatown was burned. Sometimes they were moved for real estate reasons, um, either the whole Chinatown or the individual um, temples. And in some cases, like the very amusing case of a dentist in Redding, um, California, it's misspelled here, by the way, in Redding, came up with a truck <laughs> with two henchmen and loaded everything in the in the um, in the temple that he could get and took it back to Redding in order to sell. Fortunately for the for the China, for China's memory, um, he was caught, and they they went they caught him. They brought all the stuff back to um, to uh, to Weaverville, and because the people who had built the who were regular habitués of the temple and some interested white spectators as well, put everything back in the temple where it belonged, which is the reason why that temple is more or less unmolested, in spite of the problem of the dentist in Reading. Uh, ben, I want to add, though, when we when we said uh, that there were about 200 temples in California before 1900, and the way that we count temples is uh, that not only the, like, the Weaverville Wanam Temple, which is an independent standing temple, and uh, that the sole purpose is really what we usually know for religious purposes. But when we say 200, we actually also include organizations that have a substantial uh, shrine. religious shrine in their building. And that is the norm. You know, there are a lot, a lot of Chinese associations, and they usually include uh, a shrine in their building, in their structure and open to their members. Some of them are actually uh, also open to the public, like the one that you're going to introduce later, the, the, Guang, the Guangzhou uh, Association. They have the temple, and that temple is open to the public. So that's one point we want to make. Another thing we want to uh, make reference to um, the previous uh, 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 speaking group, and then they talk so much about violence, and that is part of this fire, uh, involuntary relocation, and theft. That is all part of the uh, violence against the community, but not target particularly on the temple, right? True. Good point. Okay. So you can see that it's it's easy to say, boy, I'll tell you, they hated Chinese. That's the reason why temples failed. But there were other causes of the decline of temples. One of them was this really weird attitude shown by this advertisement in a in a Seattle newspaper. What they were trying to do is they were selling. China, real Chinese ritual goods as Christmas decorations. I ask you now what that means in religious terms, we don't know. But the term they call these sacred relics of Chinese worship, they know what they are, and they're selling them anyway for Christmas. Wow. Now, in Asia, temples did not disappear in the same way. Most temples were preserved, even by uh, even exiled communities in places or communities outside China, um, overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia had had a lot of temples. And in fact, in Southeast Asia, they have more temples built, right? Yeah, they kept building them. Nothing stopped. It's not disappearing. They're actually increasing in numbers. No, they've continued. These are still ones. So very important to Chinese and other countries. Um, the question is why they disappeared in uh, North America and not in Southeast Asia, not in other parts of the, well, actually in Europe, they kind of, they never existed. But generally speaking, um, temples were in good shape, except in North America. The question is why? Okay, now part of it was um, missionary efforts, and Christianity had played an important role in the suppression of, of the decline of Chinese religion in some places. Um, Anti-Chinese prejudice played a very important role, and um, progressivism in the Chinese community played a role. Um, but that was true everywhere in the world, and in spite of the existence of prejudice and missionaries and so forth in other places, Chinese religion thrived. But in North America, it tended to disappear. The reasons why we suggest is um, there was a decline, decrease in the number of women, of Chinese-born women with Chinese tradition, and we think also the San Francisco earthquake and fire of 1906 played an important role. 
So racial prejudice played a major role, and we know about that, and I'm sure you'll all agree. Christianity now, um, the efforts of missionaries to um, convert Chinese to Christianity uh, were very expensive. A great deal of effort went into this, starting um, very quite early in the 19th century. China was regarded as the major prize for all missionaries everywhere. The Chinese looked as though they were going to be convertible, but it turned out they were not terribly convertible. And this is another thing we do not quite understand why we'd be glad to have your comments on that. And progressivism, Chinese themselves were prejudiced in many cases against Chinese religion, traditional religion. Um, Sun Yat-sen himself, the, the founder of the Chinese Republic, is reputed to have destroyed um, statues in his, family, in his village temple. Um, let's go on to the next slide here. Oh, oh, oh wrong one. Fine. Yeah. Okay. So why nobody, why there were so convert, so few converts to Christianity, even among Chinese in America, is a little hard to understand because there were many advantages. If you were a businessman, you could make many contacts, you'd be left alone. Um, you might even be um, supported by much of the local community, um, white community. <clears throat> Anti-Chinese prejudice in literature, these are cartoons from the front of magazines in about 1900. You can see that there was a lot of feeling that Chinese religion involved human sacrifice and things like that. And the next slide is most interesting, this one, showing two boys in front of an altar. One of them said, you insulted the gods. And the other boy saying, I don't believe in gods and spirits, the only superstition of idiots. How can there be such things? This is interesting. This, of course, applies to both Taoism and Buddhism and also to Confucianism. Um, the religions of China were regarded as holding things back in China. You had to get rid of that religion. And indeed, the same attitude survived until well into the 20th century. Now, the decline of Chinese women born in America or born in China, the Chinese decline of those women in America was a serious problem. Chinese women had a hard time getting in. Um, into the United States, um, men had a hard time bringing them in. And, um, and yet, in spite of that, in China, as in America, women played a very important role in sustaining the traditional religions. But we have to emphasize that the reason that uh, the, the women, Chinese-born, uh, China-born women could not get into America so easily is because of the anti-Chinese exclusion laws. And uh, so that, that, that was the reason why they could not get in so easily, right? Yeah, there was a general idea that Chinese women trying to get in the United States were probably all prostitutes. <laughs> a terribly insulting thing, but this was yeah. believed in by many Americans. Right. So should we go on next yeah. slide? Uh -huh. Now, um, in China, as in, in America, you know, women were very important supporters of, of various Christian um, br branches of Christianity. In China, women were very, played a very important role in supporting um, the traditional religions there. Um, in America, in the early time, in the early night in the 19th century, in the 1860s and 1870s, there was still quite a lot of feminine support of religion. Um, but by the 1890s and 1900s, there were just not so many women around. Right. And the fact there were not so many Chinese women with traditional belief meant that the religions were going to decline. There were not going to be fewer, so there was going to be fewer volunteer help and less money coming in as contributions. Well, what we show here is the interior of one of the major temples uh, uh, in the early part of the uh, Chinese community in San Francisco, the Dongyue Miao. Uh, being written up a lot, and and here we show a woman, a, kneel, a woman kneeling in front of the Dongyu Mail that have uh, several uh, statues. And uh, did we say that actually most of these temples were actually Taoist temples? Very few that can be identified as Buddhist temples, and that is another some another story we might want to explore one day, but not right now. Although many of them do 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 contain statues on featuring. An important Buddhist deity, Guan Yin, That's the, true. Uh, uh -huh. who is a Bodhisattva, um, Avalokiteshvara, a very important figure in Buddhism, and yet um, she is, and we got as woman and not, as a woman, not a man. She is um, uh, worshipped by probably all 
almost all on Taoists. That's true, because that is one of the interesting features about grassroots uh, religion in China. They actually don't look at things like uh, academics too. They don't say, okay, this is Buddhist, this is Taoist, and I don't want to go to that temple. No, I don't, I don't think that is that clear-cut situation. But anyway, let's move on. Um, now, the other thing is the Great San Francisco Earthquake of 1906. Um, destroyed Chinatown, San Francisco Chinatown completely. It was the mecca of Chinese religion. That's where the Chinese religion, Chinese religious expertise existed. That's where you went to find a priest. That's where you went to make an important sacrifice. That's where you would go to communicate with the gods and so forth. And it was gone, completely gone. The earthquake was a terrible, destructive event. Now, outside San Francisco, the temple survived. Some of the old ones had been um, built in traditional styles like this, and uh, very important. We've already talked about Marysville. The Xishengong in Passerville now disappears, but that was a very important temple as well. Um, and there were a bunch of other temples, um, big ones. Sole purpose was as temples, not as organizational shrines. But one of the points that we want to, to make is that all these very traditional looking Chinese temple structure is soon to disappear. And what we have today now are just kind of remnants of that period. Because for later period, people don't want to adopt that this kind of traditional Chinese architecture anymore. And you will explain a little bit more in the San Francisco situation. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, and it turned out it was very, very expensive to replace many of these temples and shrines. And also enthusiasm had died out, possibly due to the relative absence of Chinese American women, but um, of Chinese, uh, Chinese reared women in America. But what happened was that the rebuilding of Chinatown after a, a certain amount of quarreling, um, Chinatown in San Francisco was rebuilt, but it was rebuilt, first of all, without very few temples and also with very little traditional architecture. Um, a new Chinese style was invented uh, in San Francisco, um, by the curling eaves and so forth. You've undoubtedly seen this kind of thing in many Chinese restaurants around uh, the United States. This style is a San Francisco style, which was mandated by the Ch San Francisco Board of Supervisors. And nowadays, they don't even look at all traditional. The building up in the upper left is the top floor of the Kongzhou Temple, probably the most sacred temple in San Francisco. And nowadays, it's kind of squeezed into a top floor. It's completely rearranged, and it's lost all of its original style. Even the phony style both, um, mandated by the supervisors, the one down in the lower left, um, basically uh, what happened was that um, the old Kongzhou tradition disappeared, and now Kongzhou is a modern temple, um, not as nice as the old one, in my opinion. But still very lame, you know, it's still very popular. <laughs> it's still very religiously important. Yeah, well, you, you, you've got to get, get help somewhere. The other most important temple in San Francisco was the, uh, was the great, um, uh, it was the great Qinhao Temple on Waverly Place. Um, much, much worship, much attended, a very, very popular, but you can see comparing the one to the right and the one to the left. The one to the left <clears throat> is the modern temple where the entire temple has been squeezed onto one floor, rearranged, and it's not the same. Um, the new styles of architecture were invented are these ones on the left, these ones on the right. You can see the one on the right is interesting, the largest and most powerful, um, largest and richest temple or temple-like structure in the eastern United States, and actually the most expensive in the whole of North America, was this building um, on the right, um, which was a secret society building in Chicago. It still exists. It's a very handsome building. They removed the last shrine from that a number of years ago, and now it's actually owned by a Christian um, sect in San Francisco. And then the one on the left is in Bakersfield, even though it's a tiny little rest, uh, 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 temple, but it's there, uh, you know, incorporating the Western style architecture with some Chinese features in it. But it's no longer a temple, is that right? No longer. It, it isn't now. It just actually converted, uh, renovated, and sold just a few years ago. I thought it was going to be a hamburger stand, but anyway. I can't remember what it's Let's go to the next one. 
Okay, now what did happen was, in spite of the um, of the destruction of of the fact that Chinese were not so interested in rebuilding temples, and the and the physical structures were not too important to them, it turns out. But the psychological structure, the spiritual structures, were far more important. Um, most important of all these kinds of ceremonies were Dajiao events. The first Dajiao events, um, they're still held in Hong Kong regularly, but the first Dajiao events in in North America were the one held in Sacramento after a terrifying steamboat explosion which killed many Chinese and after the horrifying Chinese Los Angeles massacre of 1871. These Dajos healed wounds, warded off future disasters. Later Dajos uh, promote community um, solidarity and we have cases, for instance, of bomb festival, almost as important and the bomb festival in, in Marysville still exists, still goes on. Dajo festivals have mostly disappeared, though remnants still survive in Chinatowns in North America. And one of the uh, features for the Dajo is the use of an um, oversized um, paper statue, mostly by paper mache statue, and they burn them afterwards. And that is uh, something that is uh, being recorded by journalists a lot because they, they like the, the bonfire, feed, uh, a, a spectacular sight. And so this being well recorded, and this particular one on the right is uh, in Pacific Grove, near near Monterey, right? Okay. Yeah, near Monterey. But um, actually, the bomb the bomb festivals have been the one in Marysville still survive, and its big feature is not giant figures; it's giant firecrackers. Oh, it's it's going to happen very soon in about That's a right. week or That's something. Right. But these. Okay. But these are wonderful occasions. Okay, right? let's go on. We only have five minutes left. All right. Well, this is um, a bomb festival. They have a contest. They um, uh, uh, rings or sticks are blown up in the air, and 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 people crowd in to grab the um, the rings or the sticks that are blown up in the air. If they get the one with the lucky number with the right number on it, they are going to be good lucky for the next year. And this is the struggle for the bomb for the remnants of the bomb are terribly popular. And likewise, um, Dajio festivals were um, big community solidarity events. They cost a lot of money. Yeah. And that was one reason why they were popular. <laughs> and by the way, the uh, the illustration here is a close-up of one of the those Dajio statue uh, held in LA in, I think it's 1896. Yeah, it just kind of very spectacular in terms of uh, in terms of uh, um, the, the the extraordinary look. There are still many Dajio festivals held in Hong Kong. So, um, many of them involve a lot of interesting uh, potential wealthy donors, and um, people from a particular village are going to be under a lot of pressure. Even though they may live in the big city, when they come from a village out in the outskirts, they're under a lot of pressure to make donations and to attend and do all this. And they're still content continued. On the other hand, there are no more bond festivals in Hong Kong because they were forbidden by the colonial government because it involved so much rowdiness and violence. And it's been forbidden in Guangdong too and in China itself because of the rowdiness and violence. So there are no more bond festivals anywhere, I think, except in Marysville in California. <laughs> there used to be a lot. Yeah. But then Dajio and Bomb, also or Bomb Days, also involve parades, and that is what we what we think that, that this is one Chinese way of claiming public space and time because these are open to the public. Many people attended, and people like to see that. You know, the parades include a lot of uh, temple uh, objects and 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 uh, sometimes dragon dance. And I don't think about line dance was that popular in in the early early days. Uh, but anyway, it's something that seems to give a positive spin to the Chinese activities, activities of the 19th century. And this one was held in Sacramento. And the Dajio events pr pr promoted um, community cohesion. Um, and there still is some remnants of the Dajio events. We say there was it still is a bomb festival in Marysville. A great fun. If you get a chance, go and see it. Yeah. But there is something like this is an event at the Mazda Temple in San Francisco, fairly recent, and it clearly is a Dajio event. Um, clearly, it's nothing like what they used to be, but still there are remnants still in existence in North America as well as in um, Asia. 
And indeed, you know, all those huge signs were theatrical uh, effect and color and sound and and just kind of a very, very attractive, even if you are not a religious person. It's, it's, it's a spectacular show. And here is um, a, uh, a, a, a New Year event um, in the modern Chinatown. In New York. In New York. As you will see, these are not exactly uh, spiritual occasions. But there is maybe a little trace of spirituality in some of these um, New Year event uh, parades. But basically, they've gotten into pleasing the uh, general public, including the white public. These are important in terms of Chinese relations with the community, but on the other hand, with the larger community, but on the other hand, they're not um, anything like what they used to be. Now, we want to remind you that there's going to be an important um, religious pilgrimage reaching to Antioch in March, and it will feature a Buddhist monk and a Taoist priest, and you can see um, what they're going to do. Um, one reason for choosing Antioch, and this is an interesting fact, is that there was actually a floating barge which grounded in Antioch, kept there for a number of years. The floating barge, or a temple on a barge, moved up and down through the Delta area and served many people. Um, in this case, um, according to the Oakland Tribune, this was an important church in its own way. And one thing that you might be able to see when you go to Antioch is a place where this um, grounded barge actually existed, where Chinese moved going up and down the river would stop. Originally, it itself moved up and down the river. Then Chinese moving up and down the river would stop and make sacrifices there. An interesting situation and unique as far as we know anywhere on this continent. And that ends our talk. It does. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Trineo. Thank you. <laughs> so I can um, stop the stop share now, right? Yeah. Yes. That's it. Yes, back to you, Jensen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shemay and Ben. That was a re just really incredibly nuanced and rich presentation. I'm so grateful for everything you've shared. I think you're painting such a rich picture of many pieces that we know and opening up continual questions that we don't know. There's a lot I want to respond to, but I want to make sure that Jonathan has time to respond. And thank you everyone who's asking all these wonderful questions as well. I think I'm going to hold them to the very end because I think we can actually, all of us have a rich roundtable discussion about it. And as Trimi and Ben said, I, and I also have to thank them for introducing us to Master Iman, who, who will be our Taoist ritual leader during the, uh, who will do an outdoor ceremony as part of the March 16th pilgrimage. So I hope I think we'll all be able to benefit from the kinds of healing of land and spirits that will be happening then. So I want to make sure Jonathan has time to um, to present as well. And let me just start with Jonathan's bio first. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Lee, PhD, is Professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University. His family survived the Cambodian genocide and arrived to the United States in 1981 when he was five years old. He identifies as Chinese, Vietnamese, and Cambodian American. He received his doctorate in religious studies from the University of California at Santa Barbara in 2009, and he has published 16 books and over 500 articles and essays on Asian American histories, folklore, cultures, and religions. Currently, he serves as editor-in-chief of Chinese America, History and Perspectives, a peer-reviewed journal published by the Chinese Historical Society of America, and he is dedicated to anti-racist pedagogy in education and has been invited to several Silicon Valley corporations, and public institutions to speak on issues of equity, inclusion, and diversity. And on a more personal note, the May We Gather team has long been inspired by Professor Lee's work on Chinese temples and California, as well as Buddhism, Taoism, Guan Yin, Mazu, other figures. And to mention just a couple uh, from his incredibly impressive body of publications, his co-authored article, Things Matter, Chinese American Culture Work and the Gods of Marysville. And we saw a picture of the Marysville Temple earlier. Um, this article offers just a very riveting case study for how the signs and symbols of Chinese religion in America are reimagined, rearticulated, and recreated. And when Duncan Williams and Funi Xu and myself, we visited Antioch for the first time, I still remember we were there on the riverfront looking over at the San Joaquin River. And this is the riverfront where the Chinatown once stood. This is where we'll be doing our pilgrimage on March 16th. 
And as we crossed the railroad tracks, we were standing on the pier, and we actually thought of your article, Jonathan, about a tale of two temples, the Matsu called from Beigan, Taiwan to Chinatown, San Francisco. And just your work could help helped us more vividly imagine what, you know, some of the spiritual and religious lives of these Chinese residents of Antioch might have looked like there on the water. And I'm so glad, Jamie, and then that you brought up the floating barge, which is so fascinating. So without further ado, I want to turn turn it over to Jonathan and um, look, really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, let me share my screen. My dog just got really needy and it's over here nudging at me. Um, so I, I was reflecting on the theme of resilience, recovery, and repair, the three R's. And so I named my temple, te uh, my talk, Temples of Memory, Histories of Historic Chinese Temples in America. And I want to emphasize the, the theme of memory. Um, so I, can I, should I show, let me go back here. So I, I think I want to anchor the stories I want to tell um, in my presentation with first kind of explaining the religious landscape in China for those that are not familiar. Um, you know, it's a, it's a mixture of Taoism, Buddhism, Confucianism, and folk, uh, what we call uh, popular religion, religion, the religion of the people. And um, you know they have they have teachings and philosophies that um, are harmonious as well as sometimes a contradiction to one another, um, and and in very simplistic kind of uh, explanation we can we can argue right that Taoism provides for a pantheon of deities that uh, intercede in our life um, in good times and in bad times um, the deities of Taoism come from history uh, actual history comes from folklore uh, comes from heroes and heroines that have been deified um, and and can can provide inspiration in in the world um, we can argue that the with the introduction of Buddhism in, into um, Chinese civilization, uh, we have then um, a, a whole new way of uh, to envision uh, salvation and life after death, and and Buddhism provides this, uh, and Buddhism provides this with its whole array of bodhisattvas and buddhas and and then the more invisible and the more complicated tradition of confucianism right um that i think many don't understand or misunderstand or give up trying to understand but the confucian tradition is the tradition that um you know that some of us call the invisible tradition of china because we don't see it in rituals uh per se and confucian temples are often called temples of culture when miao and uh but it is there that we have um the the um the view of how one can live on you know, past this lifetime. And this is where memory and lineage, right? Um, and so and so this is where the practice of ancestral veneration, but not worship, but to venerate and to remember. Uh, so it, similar to like the um, Day of the Dead in Mexico, it's a period of remembering the ancestors and keeping their memory alive so that you can forge and renewal the uh, relationships that were that that inform the richness of your life and and so what we're going to see in the landscape and in the um, examples of the temples that i will um, share is the confluence of these various uh, tradition 
um, performed and lived. And of course, popular religion are the practices and beliefs that were not necessarily part of the quote unquote institution of religion. Um, they even predate the uh, institutional um, development of Chinese religion, but they all function together. And, and what we see in the American West during the 19th century is a, just a really unique um, um, moment in Chinese religious history or Chinese American religious history. And, and that's where I'm going to go. And what I'm going to also kind of highlight is really the parallel between the migration and the resettlement experience of actual Chinese migrants and the process of um, transforming from being Chinese to Chinese American, we're going to see these parallels in um, the history of Chinese temples as well. So, so I start off with this temple, it's the Qinghao Temple, uh, Tianhao uh, Miao. The, um, the, she is the Empress of Heaven, but uh, venerated for the most part as the goddess of the sea. And, and she was carried in her shrine from Southern China um, over to the US when the Chinese, um, for, with the first wave of Chinese migration. So we don't know exactly when this temple was founded, um, but it, um, but we can argue that a shrine to Tianhou was established when the first Chinese junk landed on the shores of San Francisco, and there there was some um, articles that talked about a shrine. And then, of course, a 1906 earthquake happened. Much of Chinatown was destroyed. Temples were rebuilt. And so the, the temple here um, is on the third floor, but not at the original location. And I think it would be surprising for many Westerners or, you know, to, to, uh, to learn that the most important part of a Chinese temple is not necessarily the icon itself, but the incense ash in the incenser, right? Because um, that is the, the symbol um, of a deity's efficaciousness, Ling, uh, in terms of patrons going to visit, making requests for salvation, for help, for, for birth, um, the kids to do well in school. And so the more the more visitors a deity, a de um, uh, the more devotees the visitors a temple has, the more incense smoke there would be. And so um, the darker the image of the icon, but it's the ashes that is the most important and the most central. So historically, um, if, if it was possible, and I'm sure it was possible, so you know, um, we, we can just guess at this moment, some of the uh, ashes from a Tianho temple in southern China um, was brought with them on the ship, and then and then um, uh, was the source of the creation of the temple in the United States. So we don't have conclusive evidence that this necessarily happened. This is just the cultural practice in China uh, for temple. Um, temple uh, network kind of extension. However, if we look at um, the example from Taiwan, which is the, the other case study that I studied of Mazu. So Mazu is the same goddess as Tianhou, but in, in Taiwan, she's, uh, she's called Mazu, means like mother ancestor. So a more kin kind of um, relation there. So, uh, and, and the Matsu temple that um, Shumei and Bennett showed was the one in San Francisco that was founded in 1987 from the mother temple in Beigang. So the mother temple in Beigang was actually founded with incense ash from the Fujian temple, the ancestral temple of all the Matsu cults in the world. And, and, and that is in um, 
in, in a little island off the Fujian coast known as Meizhou. And so, and so, um, and so that, that ash that connects the, the Machi temple here in San Francisco, uh, connects to Taiwan and Beigang and then connects to China as well. And what's interesting about the case of, uh, of the Taiwan Mazi temple, which is different from the Tianhe temple, is that um, they all have, reflecting the pattern in Taiwan, uh, a regional name that's based on locality. So because the San Francisco was the first Mazu temple, they called, they called, they referenced the goddess in there as Meiguo Mazu, Meiguo meaning America, and Mazu, Meiguo Mazu. And, and uh, in the early 2000s, um, a New York temple of the same branch in Beigang is, was opened in Flushing, in, in the Queens neighborhood of, of New York in the Flushing's area. And one of the things that I, and so I completed my dissertation before the New York temple um, opened. And one of the things that I wondered about was whether or not the New York temple, because it's a newer temple, uh, this would be the younger sister, would would make a pilgrimage to the San Francisco temple, um, you know, much like the San Francisco temple would make an annual pilgrimage to the Beigang temple. And then the Beigang temple would make an annual pilgrimage to the to the Fujian or 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 Meizhou temple during the pilgrimage season. And and I hypothesized at that time that they would because the power of ritual is so strong. But to my surprise, last year when I visited New York and I talked to the temple caretaker I, and I asked questions about the, the links between their temple in New York and the one in San Francisco, he kind of hinted that they really haven't connected yet and that there hasn't been um, a, a, a pilgrimage relationship. Uh, but I started with this one because it's quote unquote the oldest one. Uh, and it was part of Chinese migration, but it's also the temple that has is still serving the immigrant Chinese population, right? Um, you know, and and it, it hasn't become a nonprofit, it, you know, like some others that I will show, and so it it hasn't um, really become what we would call a temple of culture, though it is a temple of culture in, in practice. Um, and so for the Tinghao Temple, you won't, there is no web page to the Tinghao Temple. Uh, you might find a trip advisor, uh, you know, um, thing on it, or, or, or you might find images and brief little snippets of history on it. But, um, the temple itself, uh, do not operate a web page. So, so this is one where I would um, argue, you know, um, is equivalent to a Chinese migrant that comes in middle age and maintains a very Chinese way of living in the United States. All right, so this next temple um, is in Orsville and this temple the reason why I want to highlight this is that this temple is a Buddha Taoist temple, is what I would label as a Buddha Taoist temple, because there is a Guanyin shrine and a Buddhist shrine, as well as um, um, uh, shrines to Taoist deity. But what's interesting about this temple, and it's not too far from Marysville, but what makes this an interesting one that I'm going to touch on later is that um, uh, it was founded by the Chinese community. And then it was uh, donated to the city of Oresville. So it becomes um, a historic landmark and operated and functions um, through the city of Oresville. And so you can go to web webpage and the webpage would be um, the city of Oresville's um, webpage. And, and this was part of the gold rush kind of uh, history of this area and the founding of this temple there. So, so one example of, you know, wh when it becomes a museum and it's no longer a functioning temple with, um, 
with devotees coming to light incense, some of the kind of metaphysical questions that we can ask is, you know, what happens to the power of the incense and the power of the ashes uh, that's at the temple? And I think this is where um, uh, a bit more, uh, uh, this is where I think a Confucian kind of um, analysis or a Confucian interpretation of temples of culture comes in handy in terms of the relevance and um, the, the, the aspect of recovery of the history um, becomes important. Uh, and the Temple of Kwantai, um, and Kwantai is the, it, Kwantai, the, the way they spell Kwantai and the way they even say Kwantai, right, really reflects um, a whole aspect of uh, uh, language and linguistics around be, going from Chinese to Chinese American. And it reflects uh, to a very, you know, to a certain degree, what happens to second and third generation Chinese Americans when they lose their ability to read Chinese? Um, you know, this is Wu uh, Di Miao, the 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 temple of the god of war. So uh, the god of war from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Guan Di. And so, and the you know it, it's it, it has become officially a nonprofit, a community nonprofit. Um, uh, but it, it was founded, uh, it was converted into a nonprofit by the descendants of the original owners. So Loretta and Lorraine He, uh, uh, two sisters, and their Hapa sisters, you know, um, their father married a non-Chinese um, woman. And, and then, and, and then um, but it was his grandfather that purchased this little plot of land in and, and this is in Mendocino, California, uh, a very coastal, beautiful coastal town, um, and bought this pile of land and built this temple. Um, the Chinese settlement there reflects a larger history of Chinese um, settlements that were beyond railroads and gold mining here. It was in fishery and abalone um, collection and cultivation. And um, and the the community history here is is one in which the Chinese population has uh, significantly decreased, if not just disappeared. But unlike some other communities in California, when um, and this is during the period of exclusion between 1882 and 1945. Right. Uh, this was the period of exclusion where Chinese migration to the U.S. was banned. So we had very, I, I mean, they still found creative ways to come to the U.S., but uh, the numbers were lower, um, you know, until changes post uh, World War Two. And so and so when you have the period of exclusion and where and uh, heightened anti-Chinese racism, where you drove a lot of the Chinese from smaller rural communities, uh, they went from communities like this and other small rural communities to uh, communities where there are larger Chinese American population for for safety, Sacramento, San Francisco. Right. And. And what's unique about the Temple of Kwantai now, since you know becoming an official nonprofit, um, they got money in uh, in the early 1990s. I think it was in 1990 or 1991. They got a, a major, a big grant from the California Historic uh, Pre Preservation Trust to redo the foundation, to redo the siding. And and then um, the the sisters, you know, um, with very good intentions, very sincere intentions in terms of their attempts to recover uh, their family history and the history of this temple, um, they they purchase uh, plaques and images um, for the temple, either from Taiwan, from Hong Kong, or mainland China, and they did their best to kind of um, reimagine how the temple was um, um, set up and how the temple would be used and and so this is what 
you know, I refer to as Chinese American culture work, does it reflect the quote unquote traditional placement setting ritual practice and protocol? It doesn't, right? But does it take away from the significance of of the temple in itself? And and my argument would would be that it doesn't as well. And I think um, here again, we have another beautiful example of a historic Chinese temple that then can really, you know, uh, reflect um, temples of memory uh, in in the Confucian tradition and temples of culture, again, uh, within the Confucian tradition. And so um, uh, there, their motivation for for recovering the temple was to memorialize and remember their father and of course their their chinese heritage and their their ancestors and and, and i think on that note they have done a wonderful job and it it's become a center and a site of civic engagement there there's an annual chinese new year parade uh on the street that is on uh, uh Albion street and there is uh, as well a lot of local field trips from the local schools, uh, you know, even the, the, the one right in town. And you see a lot of non-Chinese kids walking up to this uh, site, learning about the history of the Chinese in this area. Um, mm. And this one has been talked about as well, but I, I brought it up because this is the example of a Chinese temple that then was founded by the 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 Chinese um, during the period, uh, but then it was um, bequeathed to a state park. So we have Oroville, that is a city-run um, museum, and here you have a state park-run museum. So so uh, you would go to the state park for for info and images and and the history is rather like brief and not very in-depth but this temple and and it's a beautiful site if you ever get to go there in chinese it's the cloud yun ling miao is the temple among the clouds and trees or you know in the forest of trees so so you know and it really reflects the area um uh the times that i've been there it's been uh pretty foggy and 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 the 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 state park rangers have been very nice and and they did tell me that if you were chinese um or if you came and you wanted to perform a ritual that they would allow you to make your offering um so here again i think uh another good example of temples of memory and temples of culture um that really reflects the the kind of syncretism among among Buddhist, Confucian, and Taoist. And the Buddhist element in there is uh, the Guanyin Shrine. Okay, now this one I love. Um, it's in Auburn, which is about an hour maybe, uh, you know, from, from Sacramento, and maybe an hour and a half from Truckee, uh, going up to Tahoe. But, but, but Auburn is a bit more elevated, but not at the slow level. And it's um, and and similar to Viverville, I, I should mention that uh, this is known locally as the Auburn Josh House, and Josh House is just um, a kind of uh, Chinese American uh, development uh, where where you know they use the Josh sticks to make an offering, you know, the incense sticks uh, that are also known as Josh sticks and Josh. If I remember correctly, it was a deviation from a uh, Portuguese word deals for deity. And um, and uh, so this was founded by uh, the Yue family and uh, one of their living descendants, the great, great grandson, his name is Richard Yue, uh, was um, part of the restoration and recovery of this site. Uh, and this site, you'll see a boarding, there's a room where the temple care, caretaker was um, lived in. Uh, you'll see like a little desk for students uh, to learn Chinese, of course. Most, um, many of 
these historic temples also serve as uh, uh, Chinese schools to teach um, Chinese to the the generation of Ch Chinese Americans that were born in the U.S. during the um, uh, during the exclusion period, and and what's interesting about this was um, it, it is a local nonprofit founded by uh, allies of Chinese Americans, um, so non Chinese American people as well as uh, Richard Yue and his family and descendants. But Richard Yue's grandfather uh, um, did remarry a non Chinese woman, and so when he he died because he didn't leave a will that willed it to his sons. Um, it went to it was it was the temple as well as um, a restaurant that they owned in town. I forgot the name of the restaurant, but it was a Chinese restaurant that they owned in town. And so um, his stepmother kept the restaurant and took that business away from him and his siblings. Uh, but then, um, you know, um, allowed or, or not allowed, but um, uh, donated this site and to be the the community kind of nonprofit, and it has been preserved pretty well. But what's also interesting is um, if you look at these Chinese plaques. Um, uh, it, it's hard to really make sense. Uh, about you know in terms of what the characters are and what they mean um because richard doesn't know chinese and he got you know these um uh um proverbs and he tried to carve it out but you know the brush strokes um were incorrect and stuff but again that really speaks to um an aspect of chinese american culture work and the production of uh, Chinese culture by Chinese Americans in their attempts to recover and remember um, their Chinese heritage. Okay, and the Bokai Temple is another great example. So this is an, this is another example um, of a temple that is still. Uh, a functioning temple for an immigrant Chinese uh, community. So, so this temple is really interesting because um, not only is it um, uh, important to the Chinese American community in Marysville and in that uh, Yuba City uh, area region, but to larger Chinese Americans and then to the greater Chinese diaspora, because this Bokai Temple and the Bokai Parade is really well known. So during the Bokai Temple um, celebration, uh, and it's, it's going to happen soon in like early March, where they have the Bomb Day Parade, you will see uh, Chinese from from Southeast Asia or from mainland China or from Taiwan and Hong Kong. Um, uh, they'll go order their whole, whole roast pig, and they'll bring it there uh, for the rituals, for the for their offerings to be blessed, and then that food will be shared among their families and friends. And um, and you know, I did some writing and analysis about Bokai itself. Right, uh, this is another kind of uh, linguistic thing. Um, so the the temple. The name of the temple, Bei Qi Miao, really um, uh, is is uh, speaking about the location of the temple. So if you go visit this temple, it's right up next to the levee, and and so you, which might have been a creek a long time ago before they built that levee. But the primary deity in that temple is uh, Bei Di, the Northern Emperor. And and his his folklore and story is from the journey to the north. Um, Guan Gong Guan Di's story is from the uh, uh, romance of the Three Kingdom. So and and we know is Bei Di because of the iconography of of him, as well as uh, him standing on a big turtle or tortoise, this big turtle. And the story is, you know, uh, he was a great warrior, and and in and and. 
and he's part of the larger Taoist pantheon. And so um, in, in asking questions like, well, why was this temple to the God of the North placed here and established here and venerated here uh, uh, in 1880? It's because this was during the great kind of Western frontier, right? Um, and, and so, uh, you know, um, who else would you bring along that, you know, you would bring him along because he's the one that can quell evil and quell demon and, and is known for, for, um, for being able to, uh, defeat demons and, and evil forces. And if you look at the long history of it, uh, you know, we can argue that he's done a pretty good job at it because the temple is still there and the community that worships him is uh, still very strong and vibrant. And, and, and the thing about the name, I, I, I want to give as an antidote. So Beidi is actually very popularly, uh, uh, popular in terms of his veneration in Taiwan, Hong Kong, throughout Southeast Asia and Southern China. Um, you know, there's Beidi temples or he's part or his shrine is part of larger um, Taoist temples. But, you know, about 15 years ago when I, when I went there for the first time to do some field research, I went on a tour uh, uh, um, that was given to me by a relatively young, young tour guide and she was non-Chinese. And, and um, the story that she learned and that she narrated and shared with, with tourists is that, um, that there was only one other temple in China that venerated this god, Bokai. And that what made them special in Marysville is that this is the only other temple outside of China that venerated him. And... And uh, when I heard that, I was like, wow, that's really awesome, right? And, I, and, and then, but then knowing that that's not the case, because, you know, I, I went to the temple and I saw that it's Beidi, I, I kind of just asked, well, which town is this uh, other temple in? And she didn't have the answer to that. Um, but, you know, I didn't want to make her, you know, you know, to seem like the know-it-all, and I didn't want to correct her or anything. So, so I just left it at that. And I, and I marinated in that comment for a very long time to try to make sense of it, to try to understand the significance and symbolism of that kind of narrative. And, and that helped to um, uh, formulate my idea of Chinese American culture work is that uh, outside of China, in new situations and new contexts, um, immigration new con new and and so and so you know that that, that really that really helped to to um to understand what quote unquote chinese american religion is so i think this is a unique site because on one dimension, it really reflects Chinese religion, but on another, you know, um, dimension, it really reflects something uniquely Chinese American, right? So Bokai, as we know him locally, is only available in Marysville in California, right? But Beidi isn't. Beidi is all over, right? Um, as as his name uh in in china and the chinese diaspora and hanford um is part of china alley hanford is a central valley town and this town developed uh with the development of of the railroad station uh and so this is in hanford california and it's kind of like a ranching town and a farming town it's still pretty much that way uh and the history of this temple is also beautiful it became it, it became restored and preserved by uh, Chinese American residents, most of them second, third generation Chinese American, 
uh, with their allies. And, and when you look at the history of this, and there are some photos that I have um, of, of the history of the Hanford Temple, is that at one point when the Chinese, so, so during the period of exclusion, um, the Chinese in America uh, were, were, con you know, were confronting the forces of assimilation. And, and they did, uh, on some levels, attempt to assimilate and to be more American and less Chinese. So during this period, you know, we, you know, before like 1969, uh, some Chinese would refer to themselves as American Chinese, not Chinese American, right? And and I think um, when you look at the history of this temple, so this temple is a community center, a Chinese school, uh, and and when you go into the site, you see you see the statue of Guanti, you see the 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 shrine to the sea goddess, uh, also Empress of Heaven, Tianhou Mazu. And um, and and the Guanyin, and you see uh, an area where uh, you know it's like a hostel where where uh, new newcomers can stay, uh, you know. And then, um, but then, what's interesting about uh, the Hanford Taoist Temple and, and and is that at one point in their history during the period. Uh, in which they, you know, the forces of assimilation, the forces of assimilation, the pressure to assimilate was so strong, uh, they changed their name to the Hanford Taoist Church. And not only were they the Hanford Taoist Church, but um, the community uh, that that made up this, um, you know, uh, this Hanford Taoist Church community uh, went to the temple or went to the church on a sunday similar to their christian counterparts who would go to church on sunday and if you know anything about chinese temple is we don't have a sunday obligation <laughs> you go when you need to go you can go every day you can go every sunday if you wanted to um but this i thought was quite unique in terms of um illustrating the process by which, uh, you know, we go from being Chinese to Chinese American, right? Um, and so, and so, you know, this is where I I saw a parallel between uh, being a Chinese temple and becoming a Chinese American temple. So, um, so to end, one of the things that that I think about when I visit these sites and research these sites is when and where do you know what what's the spectrum uh do we go from being chinese to chinese american temples or chinese deities to chinese american deities which i think parallels our lived experience of being chinese and becoming chinese american thank you Do I have more time? <laughs> oh, I think we're just bringing me back. And if you can maybe stop okay. your screen share, that would be great. So Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Thank you. Of course. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was for all those really vivid examples of Chinese cultural work and really bringing to light kind of lineage, memory, all of these themes that are, I think, really relevant to May We Gather as well. And also, thank you so much to audience members for, you know, staying with us. I know for those of us on the East Coast, it's late, uh, but there's all these really, really wonderful questions. So I'm hoping to maybe we can bring Chui Mei and Ben back and we'll do a kind of speed round of um, responding to people some of people's different questions. Um, so I'm just going to briefly, uh, there's just a note first, hello from the caretakers of the Ying Shen Gong Temple in San Jose, California. I'm so glad they're here with us. Thank you for joining us. There was a quick note from Reverend Ron Kobada about when we're talking about North America, are you including Hawaii? And I know, Jonathan, you mentioned you are. I don't know, Chaimei and Ben, if you want to comment briefly at all about Hawaii and the uh, temples in that setting. You say, you say, China. Mm. Uh, well, I think that's a very good question. We should, we should. But then Hawaii actually doesn't really become uh, American uh, territory until the very uh, last decade of the 19th century. 
And then so um, some of the things that um, we, we've been there to look at their temples. But I think because of the burning of the Chinatown in Hawaii, uh, there, there are really no very, very old temples there, except the one that associated with the, 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 Lin, fam, the Lin family. <coughs> And even that is not uh, a lot of uh, old things left. So, uh, yeah, I, I think Hawaii is so unique and so different from the rest of the mainland American temples that there should be more special effort to look at it. Um, but on the whole, um, I, I just have to concede that I don't know enough about that area to incorporate ideas of temple development too well. But I think in general, they fit in with that general situation that more temples in the past and less temple now. But I do remember one thing, interestingly, that uh, Hawaii, more more modern temple, the 20th century shrines and temples, they are more willing to bring in Chinese uh, decorative, temple decorative elements than what I can see in some of the places in California and elsewhere in America. Do you, do you have that impression, Ben? Yeah, but I think it's because the Chinese community there is large. It's um, relatively prosperous. It's got many connections with China still. Yeah. And um, is on the whole, I think, a very vigorous and interesting example. Part of it is ethnicity. Um, you know, they have a nice um, Hakka graveyard there. <laughs> Um, you don't have Hakka Cemetery surviving in Iraq. You do in Hawaii. No, they have the best Chinese cemeteries anywhere in America. Indeed, I think. they're just terrific. <laughs> Thank you if so you much. Like going to cemeteries. Thank like, you. Which most historians <laughs> do, in fact. So. Yeah, right. Um, let me ask a few. I'm going to just ask this cluster of questions from Dr. Christian Joachim. Uh, I think they're all very interesting, so you can all of you can approach how you would like, but I just want to voice these questions so that other audience members can hear. How big a factor was decreasing support of the surrounding community, including regional participants in Dachio and the like, in the decline of the Chinese temples? So, for example, in San Jose, most Chinese Americans moved away from Heinlandville, Chinatown, leading to the temple declines. Kind of related to this question of decline, was there a decline in the number of Taoist priests in California after 1920. And regarding the idea that early Chinese migrants to North America were sojourners, does the fact, I think this is a very particularly interesting question, does the fact that building a temple in a new community was de rigueur suggest that these were people who were planning actually to stay? So for example, in 1852, migrants brought ash from a Chinese home temple incense burner. Now that's an excellent point you make, Chan Xing, um, and one which is not emphasized enough. The fact everybody says these are all sojourners, but they spent a lot of money and a lot of time and effort in building temples which were not temporary. What were why did they build those temples if there were no if neither they nor any of their descendants were planning to stay? It is possible that they were aiming this at educating or at supporting their children and their grandchildren when they came to take the place of the sojourners, but still it doesn't seem like a real sojourner mentality to me. Mm. Jonathan, I don't know if you want to talk at all a little bit about these questions of decline. Yeah. Um, you know, well, first on the sojourner, I think, you know, they might have initially for the early first wave come with the intentions to go back. Um, but life happens and, you know, they couldn't go back. Um, and, you know, and, and I think uh, the temple was a kind of really important stabilizing element in their lives when it was so unstable and stressful, I would imagine, um, being in a new country, um, surrounded by people that don't look like you. Um, you know, I imagine a high level of stress and fear and anxiety, worry for the people back home, their wives, their kids, their parents. Um, on the decline that I, 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 we don't have the, I've never seen any numbers for any Taoist priests because, you know, um, immigration doesn't ask, you know, us, them to check if they were a Taoist priest or not. Um, I suspect that, well, for sure there, there were no Buddhist monks, um, in terms of this early period. And I think um, 
the priests were uh, ritual specialists and not not necessarily a Dallas trained priest, right? Though there could have been, and they probably moved around in a circuit from one Chinese settlement to another Chinese settlement in order to perform rituals, exorcism, healing, um, and 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 a whole lot of this um, is tied to uh, Chinese medicine and their role in in ritual medicine for um for healing and 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 health um but yeah um i've never seen any numbers about you know that counted for Taoist priests um but i think you know um there 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 were probably just ritual specialists uh someone that it is well versed in in religious vernacular in rituals in the calendar and and um yeah and 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 not so much the formal Taoist priests thank you so much i wish we had more time to answer more of these questions but i also want to be respectful of everyone's time here so i'm going to just raise one more um Point. I'm just going to not ask it as a question, but raise it as a point to bring up this gender dimension. And then I think, unfortunately, we'll have to close for today. But Dr. Tammy Ho writes, compounding the effect of immigration restrictions and Orientalist stereotypes, weren't Chinese women also watched and perhaps restricted from their temple care work by Euro-American Christian Protestant missionary women who are trying to rescue, reform, and domesticate Chinese women immigrants? Historian Peggy Pasco writes a little about these conflicting social systems and dynamics in 1874 to 1939. So I think just raising another dimension of this you know, very complex picture, and I just feel so much gratitude and appreciation for the three of you for doing such careful work over all of these years. And you know, yet there's so much we don't know or can't know that has been lost to fires, to history. Um, and with that, I'm going to raise, there's one more question that probably I should field, and then I will close today's um today's session but once again just really want to thank you Trey May Ben Jonathan for such a rich conversation thank you to the audience for these wonderful questions that you've raised and I'll end on this one um there's a point about the the bomb day taking up public space and I wonder how the may we gather event on March 16th might also have this intention and how do you see all this publicness being important as a queer person we use June pride events in this way so thank you so much for this question um I'll just answer it very very briefly I would say that uh from my perspective part of may we gather is in a way about shared space and and to include those who were in some ways driven out or no longer there, Chinese immigrants, that memory, those ancestries, that lineage, but to share it with, you know, to not just call it purely Buddhist or purely Taoist, but to recognize the very diverse present day reality of Antioch, as we know, the Native American communities, the Black communities, the Latinx communities, and so forth. And I think this is kind of a perfect segue into our upcoming panel, which will be in a couple weeks. Um, so let me see, let me just share my screen really quick so that people know when that is happening. Um, bear with me. Great. Um, <laughs> oh, so it'll be on February 22nd, uh, 4 p.m., same time. And Dr. Funi Su will be moderating this panel with Karina Gold, Christine Cordero, Devin Berry, and Nalue Alexander. Um, on, and it will be a conversation about Indigenous, Black, and Asian voices together to talk about projects of land and ancestral. <coughs> so we hope to see you there for that one. Um, and like we mentioned at the top of this, well, I guess hour and a half ago, <laughs> that uh, all of the events in this series are being recorded. And if you want to support today's speakers, you can learn more about Che Mei and Ben's work through CINARC, the Chinese in Northwest America Research Committee, and through their recently published book, Chinese Traditional Religion and Temples in North America. You can learn more about Jonathan's research as well on his San Francisco State University website, and you can support the work of the Chinese Historical Society of America. Check out the long list of wonderful temples that Jonathan has uh, showed us and 
given us examples of. So you'll find a lot of chats are coming in the chat window right now. And we'll also include these as a resource when we share everything out after our last panel on February 22nd. So, and with that, um, I guess I wanna make a final note to just warmly invite all of you to attend the in-person pilgrimage in Antioch on Saturday, March 16th, if that's possible. If not, we really hope you can join us through the live stream. And once more, just thank you everyone. Again, I can't think of a better way to kind of bring in the new year, the year of the dragon. So happy Lunar New Year. Losar Tashitalek. Happy Chunjie Det. For all of you who are celebrating, I wish you all a very auspicious year of the dragon. Thank you all and take good care. All this for us. And happy new year to everyone. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.